Good morning, church. Hallelujah. Get ready to shake off some bands. Ready to get a workout in the name of Jesus. Woo! You want to come up to the front? There's plenty of room. Come on, let's go, saints. Hallelujah. Hey! Woo! Go ahead, girl. Yeah.
thank you for who you are in our lives, Jesus. Yeah. I'm so in love with you. You're beautiful, so beautiful. I fix my eyes, I fix my eyes on you. You're beautiful. of the fire right now sometimes it seems like we struggle for so long and we're like Lord where are you but he hears you he knows what you're thinking before you think it and I thank him every time he comes in and he's swift and I thank it when when we're like was that God yeah it was thank you Jesus with just Everything changes. I'm captivated with just one look. Everything changes. I'm captivated. I'll never be the same with just one look. Everything changes.
There is no enemy. There's no situation. There's no storm. There's no problem that is bigger than our God. There's no sickness. There's no disease. There's no scare from the doctor. There's no bad report. Hello, somebody. That is bigger than our God. Everything is under our feet. The enemy is under our feet. Do you understand that all we need is one look and God to give the word and everything changes. Go ahead and sing it, Heidi. Sing it. Just one look. We're declaring this over. Just understand. Just one look. Just one look, everything changes. Give your problems to the Lord. I'm now. captivated. I'll never be the same. Do you believe in this one? With just one look, I'm captivated. I'll never be the same. With just do you, church, do you understand what's going on? The Lord's attention is on us right now. You hear this? The question is now, are you ready to receive what the Lord is pouring out right now? Father, all across this place. Pour out your spirit. We give you this moment, God. We surrender this moment to you. We give you all the honor, all the glory. In Jesus' name. Church, can you lay out a shout of victory in this place? Like you're walking out of here with something this morning. We got the victory in God this morning. Come on. We're walking with something. The spirit of the living God is here with us this morning. Just like that, one, one word, one breath of God like that. Everything changes. Wow. Wow. I'm telling you, every week it's getting harder and harder to move on. I'm telling you, we can just stay in his presence. I know God has a word this morning, but Father, right now, I, I just feel like I got to release something. I feel like there's just a little bit of like hesitate. There's a doubt. There's like just things. You're, I, I, this is what I hear. I hear this. I hear there's people in here just like, but God. And they're saying, but God. God is saying, look, everything's going to change for you. And you're like, but God, what about? But God, what about? Come on, fill in the blanks. You know what I'm talking to. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm talking about. How many want to let go of that? But God, it's time to let it go right now. See, God is calling you out. See, there ain't no buts. God can. God will. God is able. Hello, somebody, right? He's able. You need to say it out loud. Say, my God is able. Come on. My God is able. Come on. Whoa. Hallelujah. Give the Lord one more shout. Come on. Wow. Man. Praise God. Listen. You're in the right place. God has got, he's got a lot of things that are going on and moving right now. Let's do this. Frankie, go ahead and bring the lights up. Let's, let's, let's greet each other. Let's welcome each other into the house of God. You're on the right place. Turn around, greet somebody, smile and wave. Give it a Amen. Underdog continues this morning. How many people have enjoyed the Underdog series? I know last week we took a little break when Pastor Ralph brought a powerful message. That was a right on time message as Pastor Ralph was getting ready to go uh, to Spain. Remember to pray for him, to pray for what they're doing over there in Spain. Uh, the ushers are still coming around. Don't worry about that. They'll, they'll make their way to you. Uh, but I want to get right back into this Underdog series.
Um, as you guys know, we've been in this series, and God has kind of led us to find stories in the scriptures, to find stories in the Bible, and to extract something that we can apply to everyday life. How God takes these underdog situations, and he gives us something that we can apply to everyday life. So what I want to do, because i got a lot that I'm going to get into. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hit you guys hard today with the word. How many people are ready for that? Y'all, y'all ready to go on a roller coaster? Y'all ready to fly through something? Y'all know I could talk fast. So I want to make sure we're ready. So let's pray. Father, this morning, we pray, Lord, that your word will do what it's set out to do this morning and inspire us today. That, Lord, we are looking to the story of Gideon this morning to find some inspiration that we can apply to our everyday lives. So prepare our hearts, prepare our minds. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, so I'm going to fly, church. I'm telling you, Gideon is a story that has two chapters dedicated to it, and there's a lot into it. Man, I could preach a whole series just on Gideon alone, but basically what's happening here is that God, uh, that the, the Israelites or the, the, the nation of Israel did uh, evil in the Lord's sight, and he handed them over to the Midianites for seven years. During that seven years, marauders would come and steal all their food, and they would be oppressed on every single side. The Midianites would come, and so the people of Israel were so afraid that they began, instead of building up towns and encampments, they would hide in strongholds and caves. They would be hidden away. They would only come out at night, and then in the daytime, people would come and steal their food. And so when you are afraid to go outside and you got no food to eat, how many know that sounds like an underdog story, right? And so they're surrounded, and God decides that he is going to raise up somebody to lead them out of that situation. He's going to raise up a man named Gideon. They're surrounded. They're overwhelmed. They're afraid. And how many know fear and rebellion can put you in an underdog situation? If you're afraid to even go outside, hello, some of us have been there during the pandemic. You might be the underdog, right? These people were afraid to go outside outside. And so God is going to raise up this man named Gideon, and he sends an angel to speak to Gideon very clearly. So I'm going to tell you the story. I'm going to read some of it, right? And so the angel comes and says, rise up, man of valor. And Gideon is actually hiding, and he's threshing wheat in the middle of the night, because that's only when they operated, because they were so afraid. And so God calls him this mighty man, but Gideon doesn't believe it. God has given him this word, and God is telling him that he's a mighty man, but Gideon doesn't believe it. And we know this because the way Gideon sees himself. So here we go. We're going to extract some things. In Judges chapter 6, this is what he says. This is how Gideon responds to that word that he's going to use you. He tells Gideon, you're a mighty man. You're going to overcome the Midianites. I'm going to use your life. And listen to what Gideon says. He says, but Lord, Gideon replied, how can I rescue Israel? For my clan is the weakest in the whole tribe, and I am the least of my entire family. In other words, I come from the smallest group, and I'm the weakest one of my group. I'm the one that was voted most likely not to succeed. I'm the one that's a better hider than I am a fighter. I'm the one that when the fight goes down, you'll see me with my camera phone over here watching from a distance. Hello, somebody. That I'm the guy that's not looking for a battle. I'm the guy that's here hiding out in the threshold. I don't know who you're looking for, but you must have found the wrong guy. Gideon doesn't see himself as the one that God could be possibly speaking to. He does not see himself as the one that God is going to use. And so for me, when you see somebody say, I'm the weakest of the weak, oh, this is a good underdog story, that we got to find something in this scripture. And there's so much, but God takes these underdog situations and he makes them overcomers. And there's so much in this story that once again, we're going to extract the one truth that we need from this whole thing. We're going to try to find one thing. And to do that, we have to look at what was missing in Gideon's life. Why did he have no self-confidence in himself? Why is it when the Spirit of God came and the Lord spoke clearly, just like he spoke clearly to you during worship why did Gideon say ah you sure you're talking to me I don't know if you were talking to me and listen to verse 16 listen to what the Lord says and we've been reading you know throughout this it's not about numbers not about strength but listen to verse 16 the Lord said to him I will be with you and you will destroy the Midianites as if you were fighting against one man the Lord makes this promise very clear because Gideon says look I'm not the guy and the Lord says That, oh, it's not about numbers. I don't care you're from the smallest clan because it doesn't matter because you're going to be fighting against, like you're fighting against one guy. doesn't matter how small you are. And we've been reading that throughout this series. Like, it doesn't matter. It's not about size. It's not about numbers. It's not about strength. But God sees things differently. And so he makes them this promise, and you got to make a note, that he says you're going to be fighting against one man. But Gideon's going to give us some insight to where his faith is at. 
Verse 17, listen to how Gideon replies to that. It says, God gives him a promise, God gives him a word, and Gideon says, if you're truly going to help me, show me a sign. To prove to me that this is really the Lord speaking to me. Don't go away until I come back and, my, and I'll bring an offering to you. So the first thing that he does with the word of the Lord is he says, give me a sign. This is where people get stuck because the word of the Lord is trying to get to them. God is speaking to them, but they simply don't believe it because God's word and God's promises are not enough. Instead of just hearing what God is saying, instead of just standing on his word, they don't want to believe it and they want to put God's word to the test. So a lot of people are stuck there because they are hearing that God is doing something in their city. God is going to do something in their life and they're like, I'm not sure I believe it. God has already given a word. God has brought you a messenger. God has put somebody in front of you to tell you, to prophesy, to speak something over your life. Man, since you were born, your mom was saying, you were beautiful. You're just wonderful. You're my child. And you're like, no, I'm ugly. I don't believe myself. See, like people can try to give you a word, but if you don't believe it, what's it really doing? And so Gideon has the word of the Lord, and he's like, well, show me a sign. He wants them to show something else. See, a lot of people are stuck there. That's because they just want to see God give them a sign. I can't really believe what you're saying, God. You're going to have to prove to me. God has been trying to get a hold of our attention. Through this, this series that God is trying to get you to understand that to see your story differently. That maybe you're not the underdog, though it feels like you're small and you're weak. And maybe you feel like unimportant. Maybe if you can see yourself the way God sees you, maybe it'll change that. And you know what happens? The angel passes the test. Does exactly what Gideon asks. The angel's there, proves the test. And so Gideon's like, oh, shoot, this is real. God might be sp speaking to me. And so this becomes the spark that they needed. Gideon then, once again... In the middle of the night, decides, okay, let's fight. And what he does is he's going to go tear down. The first thing he's going to go is do is tear down the false idol that's in the square that the Midianites put up and said, okay, you're going to worship Baal. Your God is not good, whatever. And so he does it in the middle of the night. So you almost see like he kind of believes, but maybe he doesn't fully believe. I'm going to do this. I'm going to start a fight, but nobody's going to see me do this. I'm going to go write Jesus and nobody's watching. I don't want nobody to know that I'm really the one that's posting this uh, post about Jesus. I'm going to set up a burner account, hello, on Twitter, and I'm going to post all about Jesus. And so Gideon goes and he does this, and it becomes a spark. But you know what happens? Somebody snitches him out and said, it was Gideon. Because when the, when the, when the Midianites came and they're like, who did this? The snitch came out and said, it was Gideon. And Gideon's about to get in trouble because they come to arrest him. They come to kill him. But you know what ends up happening? The people of Israel use this as a spark. They start to rally behind Gideon. Thousands of them start to get behind Gideon. They start to assemble for war. All of a sudden, the people that were afraid and they weren't really doing nothing, this was a spark. They rally behind Gideon because God made them a promise. So that God is already moving. This is already happening. People are starting to get behind Gideon. And you got to remember, this is, not about si this is not about size, but all of a sudden, Gideon's got people ready to fight with him. This is crazy. So you would think that Gideon would be excited by now, like, look, it, I'm the weakest, I'm the quietest, I'm the smallest, and now there's people standing with me, behind me, but instead Gideon doesn't walk out in faith. This is what he does. Verse 36, Gideon said to God, if you're truly going to use me to rescue Israel as you promised, prove it to me. In this way, I will put the wool fleece on the threshing floor tonight. If the fleece is wet, it would do in the morning, but the ground is dry. Then I will know that you're going to help me rescue the people as you promised. In other words, he's saying, God, I want to test you again. I'm going to ask you to do something impossible. I'm going to ask you to make this wet, keep this dry. I'm going to ask you to do a miracle that only you can do. So I'm going to ask this. And let me tell you something. That, that Listen to what's happening. That people who are afraid to fight all of a sudden are rallying to the fight. All of a sudden, all because of what God had already spoken, already because of what God already promised. Thousands of people are standing behind Gideon. And instead of Gideon getting ready for the fight, he's still asking God, can you prove it to me? The weakest of the weak is assembling armies from people who are living in fear, who are hungry, and they're rallying behind this man, giving Gideon. Can I tell you that God can be moving all around you and you're still looking for a sign? The Spirit of God can be moving, can be filling the building, and you're still wondering, God, when are you going to show up? And it's like God is already here, but you're still looking for a sign. 
You're still looking, God could be answering your prayer already, and you're still, God, when are you going to answer my prayer? You could totally miss it because of a lack of faith. This is a matter of faith. Gideon just doesn't have the faith. He can't see that thousands of people. He can't see that God is moving. He can't see that revival is happening. He can't see anything that's happening. God has already changed him. But he can't see it because we struggle with faith and we struggle with unbelief. Is God really true to his word? We see all these signs of revival happening, but, 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 but I need the impossible. God, I'll believe that Pastor Richard is saying that we're in revival when gold dust falls from the ceiling. I'll believe that the Spirit of God is here. When I go to the front and I start shaking and falling over, then I'll know that we're in revival. God, I need a sign. I need you to do something miraculous. Fill the room up with smoke. I, I don't know what it is we're looking for, but people think that signs of revival are all these miracles and signs and wonders and things like that. Can I tell you that God's word is enough? God's promises are enough. God's spirit, what he's already done is enough. That revival is here when we trust God's word. And so in this season right now, I believe that people need to trust God for his promises and trust God for his word instead of just looking for another sign and another twitch in their step. I, I just be falling over everywhere. The revival is hearing. The spirit of God is working because he promised that's what he would do. And so we can get caught up in looking for impossible signs that instead of enjoying and seeing what God is doing right now, we're looking for something else. That's why people go from church to church. Oh, the, the church, Pastor Richard, I don't like the way he preached today. Uh-uh. Oh, he cut the worship too short. I'm going to go find another place. I'm going to go find the sign that I'm looking for. And so Gideon's asking for these impossible signs. But you know, God is good. He does some impossible things. He does perform signs and wonders. He does do miracles. Verse 38, this is what it says. It says, and that's just what happened. When Gideon got up early the next morning, he squeezed the fleece, wrung it out, and the, ball was full, the bowl was full of water. That even God in this, he's gracious. He shows us things. He shows us that our faith can, that our faith is real. That God does miraculous things that I can't even explain. I'm not discrediting signs and wonders. I'm not discrediting miracles that can't be explained. What I'm simply saying is that there comes a point in your life where God's word has to be enough. And so God was gracious and he answers Gideon prayer. So you would think that would be it. God did this amazing thing with the fleece. But listen how Gideon responds, verse 39. Then Gideon said to God, please don't be angry with me. In other words, he knows that I shouldn't be doing this, God, but. Have you ever been there? God, I shouldn't be questioning you, but, so don't get mad at me, but, yeah. <laughs> he says, let me one more, make another request. Let me use the fleece in one more test. This time let the fleece remain dry and the ground around it be wet with dew. In other words, he wants to flip it so that it's not a fluke, that it didn't happen by accident. So he says, okay, I'm going to ask you to make sure that this impossible thing's happened the opposite way. So that night, listen to verse 40. So that night, God did what Gideon asked. The fleece was dry in the morning, but the ground was covered in dew. All of a sudden, Gideon is testing God's word, testing God's promises, but God is gracious enough to show it and meet what he's asking. See, a lot of us, we get so hungry, we want to see God move. And I'm telling you, many of you are in the same boat where God has simply been trying to increase your faith throughout your life. Many of you have asked God for things, and he answered it right away. There's been things in your life where you say, God, if only you would just allow, when I go to the mall, a parking spot to be open, then I'll know that I'm supposed to buy this new coat. <laughs> if I go to the mall, and right there in front, there's a parking spot. And then if there's a parking spot, you'll be praising the Lord all the time. I say, yeah, yeah, today's my day. We spend it at Macy's. Hello. But we've been in the same boat where God has been trying to get us from glory to glory, trying to get us to see. He, he's been hinting that he's with you. There's been areas in your life where your faith has paid off. Hello, somebody. I think everybody here can testify. There's been areas in my life where my faith has been proven right. And God has been preparing Gideon for this great victory through these tests of faith. God is actually preparing Gideon for a fantastic victory just like God has been preparing you. Do you know that God is preparing you to overcome the situation you've been battling for years? You might have had all these steps along the way. It didn't happen right away, but there's been little things of faith that God has proven. For a lot of us, it's hard to believe that God is really good. It's hard for us to believe that God master plan includes this little church in San Jose. That God has this master plan to move in revival in the city, but how is he going to use this little church in the hood of seven trees to bring revival? And in that little church, 
in the hood. He's going to use you. That you're a part of his master plan. It's hard for us to believe, right, that God is going to use you. But God, I'm the least educated person in here. No, you're not. Pastor Richard got kicked out of school in 10th grade. Some of you might have me beat, but I got, you know, 10th grade, I was kicked out. I was the least of the least. But God was preparing Gideon for something that was bigger than him. And so many of us have to realize that, that, that God has been building up faith inside of you because there's going to be a day where you're going to need that kind of faith. You're going to encounter something that faith is the only way for you. That you're going to hit an obstacle, you're going to come into something, and you're going to need to tap in to some faith. See, I wish, I, I'm going to be real for a second. I wish that all of us would just simply believe. Say that God's word is true and God's promises are true. I wish that we would all walk out of here and we would just walk in faith. But the reality is, is that we still struggle with it. We still battle with it in my mind. And, and this is where the story gets really good. Because what started off as Gideon testing God's word ended up becoming a test of Gideon's faith. God flipped it around on him. God remembered how this happened. And so what ends up happening is God is about to flip this thing on him. So listen to this. Gideon's been going to this. God answers his prayer, his request twice. Does a miracle. You're with me, following with me on the story so far. In Judges chapter 7, God is going to put Gideon's newfound faith to the test. And let me tell you something, that when your faith is being tested, it's part of maturing. This is part of the process. Early on in our days, God is really gracious. Then there comes a point where he wants you to mature. And he says, okay, let's see how real your faith really is. Remember how I answered your prayer about the parking lot? Now I want you to witness to somebody in the parking lot. How you like that one? God flips it around. Wait, 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 hold on. Or your faith gets tested. Somebody steals your parking spot. Uh-oh. Then your character's about to be tested. Hello. <laughs> I see all y'all parking lot bandits out here. You guys be getting angry out there. Come on. Let somebody stand in the parking lot and say, I'm saving for somebody. That's it. <laughs> Faith will be tested. It's part of maturing. So in Judges chapter 7, we see that the battle begins to happen and 32,000 men rally behind Gideon. Isn't that crazy? Gideon doesn't even have faith. He's testing God's word, testing God's promises. Now after three times of testing God's promises, 32,000 people showed up for the battle. The weakest of the weak got 32,000 people surrounding him, behind him. Do you know what God does? God's going to flip it on Gideon. God looks at it and says, 32,000, huh? That's too many. That's too many. Then you'll think it's your own strength. that I'm not going to get the glory from that. So he tells Gideon to do something crazy. He tells Gideon, I want you to tell the people, if anybody's afraid, you can go home. Gideon has to do this. I, Gideon, now, he doesn't argue. He doesn't reason with God. He's probably thinking like, okay, well, maybe a couple thousand people might want to go home. Maybe there's a few people afraid. But they can't be afraid. We got 32,000 people with us. So Gideon goes to the people and he says, hey, anybody that's afraid, go home. 22,000 people go home like that. 22,000 people leave right that. Oh, God is putting Gideon's faith to the test. 22,000 people walk out. But Gideon's probably looking at, okay, well, we got 10,000. We're okay. We good. 10,000 people. We can make this work. Then God says, remember how you tested me twice about that fleece? Remember how you doubted my word twice? <laughs> he tells them, take those 10,000 men, send them to go get a drink. The ones that drink and lap like a dog, keep those, separate those. And he brings the number down from 10,000 to 300. Now Gideon's probably thinking like, God, what the heck are you doing? Why do you want me to take these people that act like dogs? <laughs> I like to look at it as God just wanted to have some real dogs behind him. You know, there's some real dogs in the fight. That's how I was looking at it. <laughs> and now all of a sudden God is like, oh, yeah, yeah, see, now I'll get the glory from this because you're going to take these 300 men and you're going to have to fight against thousands. God, what are you trying to do to me? See, God does this in our life. He begins to challenge our faith. God will begin to test it, to purify it. If you got purified faith, God is going to test it. And so all of a sudden now, Gideon's got to face these thousands of men. And I'm telling you, I, I wish I could preach the whole story. Because, man, if I started getting into the next part, the battle scene, man, we're going to, man, it, we'd be here all day. I see nobody saying amen to that. So go ahead. Nobody said, go ahead and do it. Go ahead, Pastor. <laughs> no, I'll just tell you this. Gideon and his 300 have a decisive victory over thousands of Midianites. 
decisive victory over thousands of Midianites. He overcomes them, and it was a miracle of God. And let me tell you something, and they don't fight the conventional way. God gives him further instruction, and he has to do it a certain way. And God set him up for this, this ultimate victory. And the reason why I love this story, because I can relate it into my own life where God began to test my faith, whether it was in business, whether it was in ministry, whether it was in life, that God would begin to test my faith, and the victory would come out of it. But what, did, what gave Gideon the victory? What are we supposed to learn from this situation? What are we supposed to pull out of this? Let me tell you, what starts as a matter of faith will ultimately bring you into a test of obedience. See, when it starts off that it's a question of whether or not you have faith or not, that God will eventually bring it to a test of obedience. It comes down to it. For, for, for mature and tested faith will always turn into whether or not you're going to obey what he's saying or not. Obey is a hard word. And I'm not talking about obey shepherd fairy in the streets, you know, the shirt or the clothing brand. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about where you have to listen to what God is saying and do what he says. That's the hard part because that's 100% on you. What? Oh, what? 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 We go to God and we say, God, help me. God gives you the word, tells you what to do. Whether or not you do it, that's 100% on you. God will do his part. God will keep his promises. The only thing that's up in the air is whether we're going to negotiate with God or obey what he's saying. I know Gideon wasn't a mighty man, but God said he was. I know Gideon lacked faith. I see the way he responds. I know Gideon didn't see himself. He said, I'm the weakest of the weakest. I know that Gideon had these problems, but I also began to realize that at some point he matured to a place where he was no longer looking for a sign. He was no longer testing God's word. He was simply obeying what God said. You hear what I'm trying to teach you this morning? Instead of saying, God, wait a minute, 22,000 people left. Can we change the story? Instead of negotiating with God, he just obeyed it, sent him home. I don't know about you, but I'm going to have a hard time sending 22,000 people home when we're about to fight a war. I don't know if I'm going to send it to the rest of the 9,700. I don't know if I'm going to do that either. But you know, if Gideon deviates from this plan and doesn't obey it, I'm telling you, he's going to fail. He ain't going to overcome because only God can get the glory. So we have to obey what God is saying. And so if Gideon tries to reason with God like he did in the past, if he didn't learn from those times, he would never overcome the battle that was in front of him. Do you hear what I'm saying? It comes down to a matter of not questioning God anymore. Say, okay, I'm going to have to obey what he's saying. God's going to give you instruction. God's going to tell you. And, and we can't reason with God no more. We can't be seeking a signs and wonders and, and saying, okay, did God really move in my life? Did he really change me or not? So then if he did, then I'm just going to obey what he's saying. I think this is important. And in this whole series, we've been trying to get you to see what caused these people to overcome. It becomes a matter of obedience. The faith is there. The spirit is there. The spirit is willing. The flesh is weak. And we see that even with Jesus, like we talked about a couple weeks ago. In the garden, Jesus was praying and saying, God, let this cup pass. Lord, do we have to really go to the cross? Do I really have to endure all this pain? Is there another way? Jesus himself was like, God, are you sure about this? But what did he say? He said, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. In other words, I'm going to obey whatever you say right now I'm going to do. And if that means it's going to be a little hard for me right now, then I'm going to do it. How many know we like to run from our problems? Anybody in the building ever done that before? How many know that doesn't solve anything? How many know if you had a warrant out for your rest, running from that warrant doesn't do anything. It just stays in the back of your mind. I know somebody can relate. Hello, somebody. Every time you see a cop, you're like, drive straight, drive straight, drive straight. Check your speed level. Okay. I'm telling you, I heard stories of people saying, you know what, I got a warrant. I'm going to turn myself in, and then they let him go. When they got to a place where they just trusted God, when he said, turn him in. Hello. So even Jesus said, let this come pass. But he said that, you know what, I'm going to obey you. In the scriptures, the Bible says that God desires obedience, not just sacrifice. That he's looking for obedience, that he has favor on obedience. You know, the Bible even says that Jesus said that those that, 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 that know me hear my voice and they obey my commands. 
And his commands were simple. He said, love God, worship no other. Love your neighbor as yourself. But those that heard my word, they'll do what I'll say. They're not going to negotiate. If I say, love your neighbor, you're going to say, well, my neighbor, I don't like the way he votes. There's still people tripping on their neighbor saying, I don't like his skin color. He's kind of rude. I don't like his car. I don't like his dog. How many of you got some neighbors with annoying dogs? <laughs> and all of a sudden, we're like testing God. God said, love your neighbor. Did he say, love your neighbor if, or did he say, love your neighbor? Did he say, worship God if he, God is good to you? Or did he say, worship God? But Gideon wants to negotiate, right, early in his walk. But at some point, God's word is true or it isn't. We're either maturing or we're staying stuck in our unbelief. Can I tell you, there will come a point in your life where God will ask you to do things that are bigger than you. He'll take you to a place that's, he'll ask you to do something that's bigger than you. He'll make you step out of your comfort zone. He'll make you talk to somebody that you feel like, well, I don't want to talk to that guy. He'll make you love people. I don't want to love that person. I don't want to do that person. I don't want to give this. I don't want to do that. Like God will get you to a place where you end so he can take over. God will always lead you to a place because he's trying to teach us to walk by faith. And if you can learn to walk by faith, then there's nothing you can't overcome. If you try to do it on your own strength, you're going to come up short. But if you can get to a place where you simply hear God's word and you trust him and you walk in faith, you're going to do more than you even imagine. See, if your dream is not bigger than you, then you better ask yourself, is that really from God? If it's something that you can just do on your own, is that really from God? I have found over the years that the works of faith outweigh my logical understanding. So I have to learn how to live by faith in every area of my life. And so when I say, when God tells me that this little church is going to have big impact in San Jose, I live to it. When God says that this church is going to do amazing things in the kingdom of God or throughout the world, I live by it. I believe it. I begin to walk in it. I begin to pursue it. I begin to expect it. I believe God's word. When he says that I believe it. I live like it on my job, on my company. I think that we're supposed to be successful. And since, that, since I started with the new company that went off, we have doubled the value of it. We have doubled the revenue in a short period of time. And I still believe that God can double it again. So I live by faith. God says we can do it, then I say we can do it. If God would just give me his word, if he would just say, okay, now it's time, my role is to simply obey. When God told me to start my company in 2008, it was in the middle of the housing crash, financial crashes. We went upside down on our house. And God says, now st forget it. I, I, got, I got job offers, six figures, job offers everywhere. I could have took a job anywhere. God says, I want you to take everything you have and start a business. Some people will say, that's the wrong time to start a business. Take the job security. Take that. Because we had to go, no, where, how are we going to have medical insurance? How are we going to do this? How are we going to pay our mortgage? All I know is that God said, do it. And I obeyed it. I could have said, God, this ain't the right season. When God told us to take over this church, it was in the middle of a pandemic. Is that really the best time, God, to transition into new leadership? What if everybody leaves? God said it. We do it. God says have church outside. We do it. God says have church over here. We do it. God says open up the building do it now. This is what we do. We got to learn how to obey his word. Because that is the only path forward. You hear what I'm trying to say? God told me to do some crazy things. I did it. But it was years of cultivating and realizing that when God says something that I can simply trust and obey it. And can I tell you something? Can I be real with you that every time I did it, it didn't instantly change. In fact, when I started my business, we almost lost everything. Almost lost our house because it was all these crazy stuff that was going on with the loans. I can't I tell you the whole story. It was crazy. We almost lost everything. And for a brief moment, I would say, God, did you really say? And you start to wonder, am I really in the will of God? Because it doesn't happen just overnight. But then one thing after another, God makes it clear. See, only God can get the glory from my story. I didn't use the right strategy. I didn't start the business in the right season. I didn't have enough money to start the business that I was starting. I didn't have the right situation that was starting. I, I, you know, there was a lot of things. 
And then God even tested me even further. I, I'm just going to talk about the business because I, I believe you all need to hear this. When God told me to do that, I could have easily said, you know what, God? I need to stop youth pastoring then. How can I start a business, deal with all these crazy kids, all these crazy parents too? And I did try to negotiate. And God said, I'm going to give you a business mind, and you got to keep your ministry heart. I was like, God, can't we just pick one or the other? And Trina and I can tell you, we've been doing business, bivocational work for years, decades. And God was trying to raise me up to be ready to pastor, and God tried to raise me up to be a business owner, and God tried to raise me up because all these things are going to come together. And you watch and see all this story all led up so that God can have ultimate victory here in San Jose. I'm telling you, church, it's coming. It's coming. But we just a small church in San Jose in the hood. doesn't matter. If God gives us the word, if God says, no longer you going to be this, we ain't going to be that no more. He's just trying to get enough people in here to believe it with me. He's just trying to get enough of you people to walk out in faith and come glory to glory, come step by step, and just to build up your faith so that when the time comes and we're facing down the enemy in our city, that we are not only going to overcome them, but we're going to overcome them with overwhelming victory, that you're going to have a testimony. You're going to see those family members saved. You're going to see those people that you've been praying for. You're going to see them come to Christ because God has built up a faith in you, that God has matured a faith in you, that you've been tested by, you, your faith has been tested. Hello. And now you just walk in obedience. But I'm going to be real with y'all. We're, we're, we're not all ready for that yet. But God is working. God has us preaching this message. See, you are not an underdog because you have the word of the Lord. You are not an underdog if you got God's promises. And though you've been arguing with God, you say, God, you ain't talking to me. God is trying to build up your faith so that you can learn how to walk in obedience. Listen to this thought. You got to catch this. If you're, if you're going to walk out of here with one thing, you got to walk out with this. Tested in pure faith is only fruitful in obedience. Faith that's been tested, that's been matured, can only be fruitful in obedience. Do you hear what the Lord is speaking to you this morning? In the beginning of our walk, oh, it's good. I remember I was praying, God, I'm so hungry today. And I, I used to be so broke back then. I literally had no food. Thank God for the $2 Whoppers. Y'all remember that? Come on. That saved my life many times. And I had no food. I was involuntary fasting. And I said, God, you create. I, 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 got, all, I got all fancy with it, too. I, I'm telling you, it's it kind of embarrassing. I didn't say it to the 9 o'clock. But now that it's being recording, I guess I'll say it. I, I was worshiping God because I really just wanted some food. And I started saying, God, you created the heavens. Your splendor and your beauty is everywhere. You put the stars in their place. I know you can feed me today. I kid you not, man. I'm just a teenager. This is my prayer. I'm 16 years old, just learning to walk with God. I'm just saved a few months. And I said, God, you're so wonderful. And in the gutter, when I was walking, marveling at God's splendor, there lied $10. And I praise the Lord like you wouldn't believe. We going to McDonald's. Hello, somebody. <laughs> and I calculated it too. I said, God, you get $1. I got $9. <laughs> Man, kind of crazy. But, you know, I realized something, that God can give me $10. He can give me $100,000. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> if you all know my life, this is why I say we're going to develop that land. But, but we haven't developed it. The church has been here since 1975. It's been 50-something years, and that land has not been developed. Don't matter, because God gave me $10. He can give me $100,000. And you'll see 
But he's trying to increase all our faith, change our expectation so that we can walk in, in obedience and that we will see the victory. Church, are you hearing what I'm saying this morning? Man, I got to wrap this up. Let's bring this thing to a close. First Peter writes this, and I love the way Peter writes this because it's going to get you in perspective. Because tested in pure faith is only fruitful in obedience. Peter writes, he says, you have faith in God whose power will protect you until the last day. Then he will save you just like he always planned to do. And on that day you'll be glad. Even I have gone through many trials for a while. Many of us have been through many things. We've gone through the trials. Verse 7 says, your faith will be like gold that has been tested in the fire. And these trials will prove that your faith is worth much more than gold that can be destroyed. For they will show you you've been given praise and honor to glory when Jesus Christ returns. Purified faith, tested faith is more valuable than gold. When you learn how to trust God, when you learn how to trust his word, when you've been purified and when you've gone through the trial and you know that your faith is genuine, let me tell you something, it's more valuable than gold. Because if you got that pure, tested faith that becomes obedience in God's word and on his promises, no matter what's in front of you, you're going to overcome. You will never be the underdog when you are standing on God's promises. When you know his word is true and what he said about you as being a child of God is true, nobody going to be able to lie to you. Because I know what God said. What I love about the story of Gideon is it shows us for God to move doesn't take 32,000 men. It just took 300 real ones. I hope you catch what I'm saying. It's not about the numbers. That you, that I, this church, we can do more with a handful of real ones than 32,000 just along for the ride. You can accomplish more. So you, don't need, you don't need a million friends, man, on Facebook or on Instagram. You can do so much more with just a couple of real ones. You just got to learn to surround yourself with the real ones. Because then God can move because then only God can get the glory. So why wouldn't God use a small church in San Jose to bring revival? Why wouldn't God use somebody with your background, the weakest of the weak? Why for somebody from the hood, uneducated? Why couldn't God use somebody like you? Or why couldn't God use an engineer in the Silicon Valley? Engineers got a reputation. They think too much. Or they're, they're atheists. And there's this and that. I work with all these tech people. Why couldn't God use a bunch of engineers for the next revival? Why couldn't it be in the Silicon Valley? Why couldn't it happen right here? People always telling me, oh, you got all those smart people from Berkeley. They ain't smart. They don't believe in Jesus. They ain't smart. <laughs> what you talking about? I was kidding. Uh, so Berkeley grads in here about to shoot me. Hold on. I'm all about Cal Berkeley. Hello, Marshawn Lynch, all those people. <laughs> I was kidding. <laughs> you can call me the under God if you want, but I know. I know that I'm not. Because I know that God alone is going to get the glory from my story. I know that God alone is going to be the one. And whatever he says to do, we're going to do. We're going to walk this thing out, church. We're going to walk this thing out together. We're going to trust God at his word. We're going to do this together. When you're feeling overcome, I'm going to stand with you. I'm going to pray with you. I know that God is trying to bring you out of your circumstance. God is trying to use you in this church. And for that, I'm grateful grateful, grateful that this is where we are. Barely 300 sometimes. But God can use us to do something great. Let's pray. Father, today, I pray that you would help us see our place in your design victory over San Jose, over the situations that are in front of us, over the cities. You know, God has brought people from Tracy and Modesto, like Heidi coming from Modesto. God's brought people from all over. Los Banos. Napa. Brought them all here to the hood in seven trees. Because God is about to spring forth revival 
bigger than just a city, our little church. Father, show them you've been working on their faith. You've been advancing them in their faith, getting them ready for victory. If you believe that, can you say amen? See, I, ha I, I just feel like I have to say this, man. Your story is not going to be like my story. You may not start a business. But let me tell you something. Whatever God has put in front of you, it's going to be great. And, and we got to figure out greatness isn't just making money or, you know, doing this or doing that. Greatness is doing what God tells you to do. Do you hear what I'm That's great. If, if, if you overcome it, just you're going to be a better father, a better husband. I'm telling you, thank God for that. Don't compare stories now. Man, I tell you, I'm trying to wrap this up. I'm trying to wrap this up. There's one more part of the Gideon story. I didn't even say this in the 9 o'clock, but I just see it. There's one more part of the story I, I didn't mention, and it just came to me right now. What started with 300, and once the battle was starting to go favorably, and they were winning, the Bible says that all those people who went home in their caves that were afraid rejoined the fight. Do you realize what your faith can cause in other people? Do you, do, you, do you understand that your testimony, when you begin, when you become the real one and you're walking it out, what it can do for your family when they see the victory that's happened over your life? They'll come out of their caves. They'll come out of their fear. They'll come out of their anxiety because you overcame, because you began to walk out in faith. Then all of a sudden it begins to get everybody on board. You say, you get discouraged because your husband's not with you at church. Or your wife's not coming with you to church. Walk this thing out. And when they see how real the change really is, declare this over your life. Father, that my victory is tied to their victory. So if I got to be the real one, then I'll be the real one. If I got to endure the fight when it's only 300 of us, when it seems like we can't win, then I'll do it. Make that your prayer. Say, I'll do it, God. I will obey you. But I'm asking you, Lord. I'm asking you, Lord, that when we start to win that fight, that you will draw all those who are afraid into your house. Let them see my life, my story, as inspiration for them to find you, Lord. And church, if you make that your prayer, that you're willing to go whatever you got to go through to inspire others, we'll have revival. Wow, God is so good. Can we give the Lord praise? That was a, man, I, I just feel like that was the key right there. I think we just unlocked something right there. Your story is going to inspire others to join the battle. Hallelujah, praise the Lord. Listen, church, if you're here today and you're not sure that you've received the Lord, you're not sure that you're going to walk out of here and you're not sure that you're going to enter into the kingdom of God, don't leave here without talking to one of us. I'm telling you, I, I feel like God is doing this. Like you just got to obey his word. And I'm telling you, and we're not going to do the whole hand raise, all that stuff. Listen, if you're here today and you're not sure you know the Lord, come find us at the front. Guillermo's going to be up here. Tomas, come on up here. These guys are going to come up here. They'll pray for you. They'll lead you. I'll pray for you. Just come up here. Find a place on the X. We'll come talk to you. We'll lead you to the Lord. My wife is here. We're going to lead you to the Lord. Amen. Today's your day. You did not hesitate. Today you did not hesitate. Church, if you need prayer for anything, come on up here. If you want to receive the Lord, come up this way. If you just want prayer, come see us. God bless you guys. You guys are dismissed. Go ahead, Trini. You can pray for her. God is good.